I'm deeply honored and grateful for this opportunity. It's always a thrill to be at Founders Baptist Church, and I'm thankful that we have the Word of God before us. Let's pray together. Lord, would you so work through your word that we would believe what the scriptures say, that we would understand the perspective, the worldview from which the biblical authors write, that we would resonate with it, that we would embrace it, embrace it and that it would make us Christ-like. Particularly, Lord, we pray that you would make us Christ-like in the aspect of courage, and we pray that you would help us to, to see that the life of unfaithful cowards is not a life worth living. Embolden us, Lord, we pray, by the hope of the resurrection, by the truth of your word, by the spirit-empowered faith in your promises. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I am going to be contending this afternoon that resurrection hope is a ground, the ground of Christian courage. Resurrection hope is the ground of Christian courage, and as kind of an extension of that, I'm going to claim, once we get there, that in the New Testament, the resurrection comes at the beginning of Christ's earthly reign. So I'm going to argue for the perspective that the resurrection of believers happens prior to the millennial kingdom. Uh, but before we get there, uh, I, want to, I want to take you through the, the outline of what I'm going to argue this afternoon. And um, biblical theology, I'm, I'm a professor of biblical theology, and I've written books with biblical theology in the title. So I want to give you a definition of biblical theology. It is the attempt to understand and embrace the perspective of the biblical authors, the interpretive perspective, the worldview of the biblical authors. In other words, we're trying to understand how did the biblical authors think about things? And then our next move is, however they thought about it, that's how I want to think about it. That's what biblical theology is. We're trying to think like the biblical authors thought. I am of the persuasion that the biblical authors thought often, chiastically, um, if, you, if, if you're familiar with this word, chiasm, it's the Greek letter chi is shaped like an X, and, and it's one half of that X. So the, the first part is going to correspond to the last part, the second to the second to the last, the third to the third to the last, and then there will be a central turning point. So in my attempt to understand and embrace the interpretive perspective of the biblical authors, my sermon has a chiastic shape this afternoon. And I'm going to use this um, architecture of this room right here uh, to lay out the chiastic outline of my sermon. We're going to start in this gray space over here, and I'm going to begin by talking to you about courage, and then we're going to move up into that white space over there where the lyrics are splashed on the wall, and at that point, I'm going to talk to you about hope, hope in the resurrection, hope in the millennial reign, in, reign, reign of Christ, and then we're going to move into some Old Testament validation of this idea of the resurrection. So in essence, what I'm going to try to show you is that from the very beginning, God's people are believing that God is going to raise them from the dead and restore creation and make it so that his purposes that he set out to achieve when he built the world will be accomplished. And we'll start at the beginning of the Old Testament. Uh, in the center, right here in this center point, we'll look at at the book of Revelation and the role that the resurrection of the dead plays in the logic of the book of Revelation. And I'm going to try to show that the logic in Revelation is the same as the logic that we saw in the Old Testament. Then we'll consider some other things in the New Testament on sort of the course, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. And then in the white space over there with the scoreboard, um, again, hope, and particularly hope in resurrection and the millennial reign of Christ, and then in the corresponding gray space over here, we're back to courage. I remember the evening, I was lying in bed, I was asleep, and noise in my house awakened me. And I am ashamed of what I'm about to tell you. I thought to myself, maybe if I stay in bed and I don't cause any trouble, they won't hurt me and they'll just leave. <laughs> 
That's shameful cowardice. We don't have to learn to be cowards. Our first father was a coward in the garden, and he failed, and we inherited the disposition to cowardice from him. I am grateful that in God's providence I had been exposed to biblical teaching, exposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus and his courage, and uh, some things that I was reading at the time, and one, one quote in particular, so I'm talking about courage here. I'm going to read you this quote at the end over here when we're talking about courage at the end. This quote in particular had spurred my thinking about what courage is and how it works. And after the thought of maybe if I stay in bed and stay quiet, they'll leave, my next thought was, if they harm my wife or my children because I stayed in bed, Life on the other side of that is not worth living. And I grabbed the baseball bat next to my bed, and I began my patrol through the house. And praise the Lord, nobody was in the house. Hallelujah. Nobody was in the house. (laughs) Courage is the result of the recognition that being faithful to the Lord, being faithful to God's word, to God's people, to those under my protection— Being faithful in these ways is more important than staying alive. That's what courage is. Courage is recognizing faithfulness is more important than me preserving my life, than me saving my own skin. To be faithful to God matters more than staying alive. What enables such courage? Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think that... Knowing what Christ has done for us enables courage. But I think a huge undergirding ground for courage is confidence that God is going to raise the dead. Believing that from the beginning to the end of the Bible, the Lord promises he's going to raise the dead. This can enable us to say, this life is not all I have to live for. I believe that God is going to raise the dead. I believe that life on the other side of the resurrection is going to be much better than life on this side of it. And that's what I'm living for. So I must live now in a way that, to use language from Luke 20, verse 35, I am one who is considered worthy to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So hope in the resurrection is a ground for Christian courage. Um, now, what I, what I want to do is I want to try to convince you that in the Old Testament, from the very beginning, we have indications that God is going to raise the dead. And, and to do this, I would invite you to open to Genesis chapter 1. And, and I, don't, I can't take a lot of time here, but I do want to try to develop this for you because I want to plant this seed in your mind, and I want you to be a Berean, and I want you to study the Scriptures and see if these things are so. I, recently, a, a Ph.D. student of mine named Tom Sculthorpe brought this to my attention, and it blew my mind, and I think it is dead on right. So here's, here's what I'm proposing to you. God by means of what he spoke in the days of creation, did some things intentionally. And then when God inspired Moses to write this up, he worked so that Moses understood what God had done. And, and, and thus we have what I'm about to, to point to. Now, <clears throat> another aspect of this is that Moses, in his methodology of writing Genesis 1 through 3, I think that what he's doing is is introducing concepts for us, particularly in Genesis 1, that are then developed some in Genesis 2 and then are further expanded on through the rest of the book, particularly in Genesis 3. In other words, as these concepts and terms are introduced in Genesis 1, they are foundational for our understanding of what we read in Genesis 2 and 3. One more comment before I draw your attention to verse 11. That's what we're going to look at. At the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. The first three days, he forms. The second three days, he fills. And it seems to me that as part of the forming, when he makes vegetable life here on day three in Genesis 1, 11, there's a difference between vegetable life on the dry land that we have in Genesis 1, 11, and then human and animal life in days four through six, or really day six is when um, he'll make man, 
and he'll also cause um, um, the waters to swarm with living creatures on day five and, and so forth. So I think there's a difference between the, the forming of vegetable life on day three and then the making of human and animal life in the corresponding days as he fills. And I say that because of what Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 contains. Look at Genesis 1, 11. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed. This is a profoundly important word in the Old Testament, this word seed. And our first exposure to this word seed just happens to come on the third day. And what happens when a plant yields its seed? Well, let's say that you've got um, a sunflower, and, and it's yielding seed. Well, it's going to release those seeds. And I, I'm going to use language from the New Testament that I think really validates what I'm saying. That seed is going to fall into the ground and die. And then it's going to bear fruit. And, and look at what it goes on to say. Plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. Years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the state of Washington. And um, I was up there for a, a conference. And they put me up with this apple farmer. And this man showed me his orchard. And these apples would fall off the tree and the seed would fall into the ground and die and it would bear fruit. He would let, he would let those apples lie there until the apple rotted and the seed thereby was planted in the ground and then here comes a new apple tree up out of the ground. And, and so the reason I'm saying there's a difference, I think, between animal, or vegetation and human and animal, animal life is because I don't think this kind of dying in the seeds violates the idea that there's no death before the fall. I think in, there's a conceptual difference between vegetation and, um, you know, um, living creatures. Um, so on day three, God makes these seed that bear fruit according to their kinds. And then you notice in Genesis chapter three, after the sin of the man and the woman, it's the Lord who's talking to the serpent who says... I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, why would the Lord do that? Why would the Lord speak of this descendant, human descendant of the woman as a seed? And, and across the Old Testament, this, this hope from Genesis 3.15, extending down through the generations, is regularly referred to as a seed. I'm going to give you one more biblical theological way of thinking about these things that I think validates this way of thinking about seed, and it's from Leviticus chapter 15. Um, the, if, if you're familiar with the, the, the Levitical code, you know that it's sort of built out of the Garden of Eden situation. The Garden of Eden is a clean realm of life where, there's holy, where, where God is, there is holiness. Where God and holiness are is where life is. And so to be to become unclean is to be rendered unfit for the realm of life, and you have to be driven out into the unclean realm of the dead. Because if you're alive and you're unclean and you're in the presence of God, you're going to die. This is why there are all these warnings about you have to do it this way, that way, and the other way, lest you die. So this connection between sin and death is being reflected, and, and I think that all of the different ways of becoming unclean are ultimately reflecting contact with death. So in Leviticus, if I'm in a tent and somebody else in the tent dies, I'm unclean through my contact with death. If I have some form of dermatitis, which I think that's what they're referring to when they refer to leprosy, and there's dead skin flaking off my body, my contact with death renders me unclean. If life fluids leave my body, when those life fluids leave my body, if I'm a woman and I have my monthly cycle, when that life fluid leaves my body, it is no longer alive and my contact with death renders me unclean. I think this is why you have twice the period of uncleanness for a female child, baby that's born as you do for a male. Uh, if a male is born, the mother is unclean for 30 days. If a female is born, the mother is unclean for 60 days, I think because that that female baby is also going to have a monthly cycle, and it's like there's double the uncleanness that's going to result from this. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 16 says, I don't like the ESV's rendering of this. It says, if a man has an emission of semen. In my opinion, Bible translators should translate the text, not interpret it. You know what the text literally says here? If, if a man 
has a lying down of seed. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a noun form of a word that means lay down. So it's like he lays down seed, zerah. It's the same term. If a man has a lying down of seed, well, he's unclean. Why? Because the seed has left his body, and when, when the seed leaves his body, it's no longer alive. It's as though it's died, and his contact with death renders him unclean. Same thing happens in verse 18 if a man, again, has a lying down of seed with a woman. That's, that's the expression there. Um, both of them shall bathe themselves because they'll be unclean until evening because the life fluids have left their... Now, here's the way I think they're thinking about this. When the seed leaves the man's body, it's as though it's died. The seed is dead. And when it, when it enters the female's womb, it's as though it has fallen into the ground. And thus, childbirth is like resurrection from the dead. Because the seed has fallen to the ground and died, and now it's going to bear fruit. Uh, I think that uh, this also informs a, a way of thinking about barren women giving birth. And, and so in the book of Genesis, Re, um, Rebecca is called barren. Um, um, Oh, sorry, I should have listed Sarah first. Sarah is called barren. Rebecca is called barren. And then Rachel. They're, all three of those ladies are called barren by the text. And all three of those ladies wind up having children. And in the Old Testament, um, for a barren woman to give birth, this is like life out of death. So w- the reason I'm talking about this is because I, th- I don't think it is the case that the idea of resurrection from the dead is a late development in Old Testament theology. I think it's the case that from creation, Moses is thinking. As Moses writes the account of creation, there's a logic that's at work in his thinking that I, I think goes like this. Adam sinned and brought death into the world. God made a promise about seed, and that promise about seed means God is going to overcome death through that seed of the woman. And that seed of the woman is not only going to overcome death, he's also going to cleanse the world and he's going to renew creation and he's going to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises. I think that Moses has that logic at work as he tells the story. And and I think that that hope for the resurrection also informs these accounts of barren women like Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel giving birth. And you can can jot these references down. You can go look at them later if you'd like to. But in Romans 4, 17 through 19, Paul speaks of Abraham believing the God who calls things that do not exist as though they do. He speaks them into being and who gives life to the dead. This is what, and, and Paul is specifically talking about the birth of Isaac there in Romans 4. And then the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11, as he speaks about about Abraham and Sarah having Isaac, the author of Hebrews also speaks of how Abraham's body was as good as dead and Sarah was as good as dead and Isaac was born and it was like resurrection from the dead. So resurrection hope, I think, is, is there from the beginning. And, and I could also take you to 1 Samuel chapter 2. You could go look at 1 Samuel 2, 5, and 6 where the author of Samuel, recounting Hannah's prayer, recounts how Hannah said, um, uh, the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children is forlorn. And then the very next words are, the Lord kills and brings to life. So it, uh, Hannah juxtaposes barren woman giving birth with God killing and raising from the dead. Just a couple of other um, Old Testament statements in the direction of resurrection. Deuteronomy 32 39, Moses uh, presents the Lord saying, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver from my hand. So the Lord is just coming right out and saying, I raise people from the dead. Now, I want to draw your attention to, to Psalm 1, and this is related to to the case I'm going to make when we get to Revelation 20. I would invite you to look with me at Psalm 1. And in verse 5, the psalmist writes, 
you know, he's, he's gone through, blessed is the man who doesn't do these things, but his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh, the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. That's interesting, isn't it? That he would liken the blessed man to a tree. And what, a, you know, trees are plants bearing seed according to their kinds. And, and then in verse 6, he, he said in verse 4, the wicked are not so. Then verse 6, therefore the wicked... The ESV renders this, will not stand in the judgment, but the Hebrew verb is kum. And the Hebrew verb kum uh, is, is like arise. The, the, the Greek translators, when they, when they translated this Hebrew text into Greek, it, they translate it, the wicked will not rise in the judgment. That, that's the way it sounds. So, so you've got the blessed man who's walking in the righteous way, and then there's this statement that, that the wicked will not rise in the judgment. It sounds as though there's going to be some kind of a judgment at which the wicked will not rise. And then along those lines, look with me at Isaiah chapter 26, where Isaiah says, he says in Isaiah 26 verse 14, they are dead. They will not live. They are shades. They will not arise. So he's talking about dead people who will not rise. And then, you know, I just want to factor in here what Daniel says. This is where a lot of of Old Testament scholars will say you finally get the doctrine of the resurrection, you know, explicitly articulated. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, if, if we put Daniel 12, 2 next to Psalm 1 and Isaiah 26, I, I, can, I can imagine some people saying, this sounds like a contradiction. Because it sounds like Daniel 12, 2 is saying, everybody's going to rise, some to reward, some to punishment. But Psalm 1 and Isaiah 26 seem to indicate the wicked are not going to rise. How do we, how do we reconcile this? I think that John in Revelation articulates a a reconciliation of these seemingly uh, disparate passages in the Old Testament. And I think what he's doing is just articulating what everyone would have assumed, what everyone who believed what he believed would have said had had we asked them this question. Like if we had said, hey, Daniel, how do you reconcile what you're saying there in Daniel 12 too with Isaiah? I think Daniel would say, well, there's going to be a resurrection, and then the world is going to be uh, cleansed and renewed by the Messiah, and then the rest of the dead will be raised. And I think Isaiah would have said something similar. So as we build toward Revelation 20, let me just take you through um, some of the, the logic of the book of Revelation. I want, I want to, to show you some statements that are made to head off some of the misinterpretations, I think, what I, think, what I regard as misinterpretations of Revelation chapter 20 and the, the language about resurrection there. So I'd like for us to begin in Revelation chapter 12. And I first want to draw your attention to what we find in Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. Here we read, this is speaking of, well, it'll it'll become clear what it's speaking of. It says, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So this is talking about these people we've been hearing about. People who were faithful to God and they conquered Satan by being killed. It's a really ironic uh, feature of the teaching of Revelation, you, you kind of see the same thing back in Revelation 5 about the lamb who is standing as though slain. The, the lamb with, with seven horns, the fullness of military might, who has triumphed by being slain. And, and now the followers of the lamb, the people of the Lord Jesus, they triumph the same way. They, they, they conquer Satan by being martyred. That, that's what this verse is describing. Um, so you conquer Satan by being faithful unto death. And, and Satan in this passage is thrown down to the earth. And notice what he does here in Revelation 12, 13. It says, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, 
he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And then when he can't get her, look at what it says in verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her seed. And then we're told who that seed is. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Now, the reason I started here in Revelation chapter 12 is because those who take an amillennial interpretation, and and the amillennial interpretation, it's not really saying, well, it it is saying there is no millennium in the sense that it's saying there's no future thousand-year reign, but what they mean is we're in the millennium right now. So they would say we are realized millenarians, and they would claim that we are in the thousand-year reign of Christ right now. And the way that they would interpret Revelation 12 and Revelation 20 is to say that the two passages are describing the same events. And we're going to go read Revelation 20 in just a moment. And I just want to note here in Revelation 12 that the dragon is making war on the seed of the woman in verse 17. And we're about to see how he pursues that war in Revelation 13. And just to, just to anticipate, look at 13. 14, where it says, by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth. Okay, so the dragon is making war on the seed of the woman. That's Christians. Notice there in 1217, the rest of her seed, seed of the woman, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's believers. So the dragon is making war on the seed of the woman. That's believers. And the way that he's making war on the seed of the woman is by 13, 14, deceiving those who dwell on earth. And what he's, the course he's pursuing is um, he's telling them to make an image uh, for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And then anyone who won't worship the beast is put to death. Okay, so just to develop this a little bit, um, right after these events in Revelation 12, at the beginning of chapter 13, uh, it's, it's interesting to see the way that John describes what the dragon does. And this is informative for us because, because Satan doesn't come up with new strategies. Really, the strategy that he's pursuing here in, in Revelation 13 is the same strategy that he pursued in Genesis 3. Uh, what Satan does is he takes good things that God has done and he twists and perverts them and tries to ruin your life with the perverted version of God's good gift. And so what Satan does here is he raises up this beast and and what he's raising up is a false Christ. Uh, the, The beast has these seven heads and one of the heads has a mortal wound and yet it was healed. It's a fake Christ. It's a fake death and resurrection, but it hasn't redeemed anybody. Satan's fake Christ. And look at what 13.4 tells us. It says, they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Here, this is a, a, like a distortion of Exodus 15.11. You remember after the, the exodus from Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea, Exodus 15.11, they say, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? And, and now they're taking these words of praise directed to the living God, and they're saying, who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? And and then look at what the beast does there in in verse 7. It was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Okay, so the beast makes war on the saints by killing them. And he conquers them by putting them to death. And we know from chapter 12, 11, that in the same way that the beast made war on Christ by trying to get him put to death... And ironically, there's this ironic reversal where the death of Christ is actually the triumph of Christ. So also it is with the followers of Christ. Satan makes war on the saints to conquer them and kill them. And 1211, they triumph over him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So as he thinks he's winning, he's actually losing. But then the text goes on there. It says in verse Eight, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everybody, everybody will respond to Satan's fake Christ the way they should respond to the Lord Jesus. 
The Lord Jesus is worthy of worship. His death and resurrection actually accomplished redemption. It was an act of love. It, it was an act of propitiation. And, and it should result in worship to the living God. And people reject it. But then they, say, they see Satan's cheap knockoff and they say, this is what we need. All who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. I think this means only the elect will refuse to be deceived by one of Satan's schemes. And, and I think we could go throughout the history of the world and we could find scheme after scheme from Satan and we could find example after example of, of believers seeing it for what it was and refusing to be duped by it. And we know how the world responds to this. The world responds by hating believers. It's happened throughout history. It's going to culminate at the end of history. And look at how John responds to this in verse 10. But before I, before I read this verse, I just want to recount um, a, a conversation that, that I was part of several years ago as the, uh, as the gay marriage and the, the transgender stuff began to heat up. I was, I was in a room with some other uh, Christian leaders and thinkers and so forth, and, and um, people were commenting on the direction that this was going. And there was one particularly significant leader in the room. And, and the only way I know to describe him is that he was just wringing his hands. And he was saying things like, I don't know how a Christian is going to be able to be a lawyer in this country, the way that things are going. I don't know how a Christian is going to be able to be a doctor. I don't know what pastors are supposed to say to their people who are forced to toe the line on gay marriage or, or transgender ideology or whatever the situation is. I don't know what a, pa it's gonna cost them their livelihood. How, how is a pastor supposed to counsel people in that situation? That's the way that this, this Christian leader was talking. Oh, and you might've been in the room with me. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. John's response to all this is, if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. And then he says, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. John's attitude is, look, if you're going to jail, you're going to jail. If you're going to be a martyr, you're going to be a martyr. If you believe, if you're a, a believer, if you're a saint... If you're somebody whose name's in the Lamb Book of Life, you'll persevere. That's how you respond. If it's going to cost you your job, it's going to cost you your job. The beast then uh, summons up, it's almost as though Satan has a false trinity here. You've got the dragon who, who's putting himself in the place of the father. And then he's got the beast who's the face, fake Christ with the seven heads. And now in verse 11, he's going to have this other beast who's kind of like his fake Holy Spirit, and he's going to cause people to worship the beast who had the, the wound, the mortal wound that was, was healed. And I want to draw your attention to verse, verse 15, where it says, it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Uh, you know, I think we can point to Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler is, is demanding that the pastors in Germany take a, an, a, an oath of personal allegiance to him. And he said, they will sell their souls for the pitiful little salaries that I give them. That's one of the problems with having a state church. Um, we, could, we could multiply examples of this. And anyone who doesn't take that oath of allegiance... Maybe they wind up slain with the sword in Nazi Germany. Look at what it continues to say here in verse 16. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't want to debate with you what that signifies how it's going to be fulfilled. I just want to draw your attention to the recurrence of this language in the book of Revelation, mainly to, a, to try to show that the amillennial interpretation just will not work. So we're going to get to Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to see how probably the predominant amillennial interpretation is that when people are resurrected there in Revelation 20, they will say, that means that these people 
are actually alive in the presence of God in the intermediate state. That's how they interpret the first resurrection. Well, look at Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, John writes in verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. Uh, We've seen this sea of glass earlier in Revelation 4. It was before the throne of God in heaven. And notice how 15.1, I saw another sign in heaven. So John is having a vision of what's going on in heaven. And now the sea of glass is mingled with fire. And also, those who had conquered the beast. This is informed by Revelation 12.11. They conquered by not loving their lives even unto death. And its image, Revelation 13, when uh, the, 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 the another beast in 13.11 makes an image those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. This is all Revelation 13, 14 through 18. They're standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they're, they, look at verse 3. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the servant of the Lamb. So it's like they're singing the fulfillment of the song of the sea from Exodus 15 because what Christ accomplished is the fulfillment of the Exodus from Egypt. My point here is that The resurrection in Revelation 20, I don't think, can be the entrance of those people into the intermediate state because they're already in the intermediate state in Revelation 15. Now, I know that the amillennialists want to read things uh, cyclically and recapitulatorily, and I just don't think that interpretation accounts for all the details. So with all this said, let me invite you to look with me at Revelation 20, and let's start reading in verse 1. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. Now, you remember in chapter 12, amillennialists want to read chapter 12 and chapter 20 as telling the same story. But in chapter 12, Satan is not taken and locked up in a pit. He's thrown out of heaven and he goes about on earth wreaking havoc. He's not in any way restrained. He's only been driven out of out of heaven. But here, verse 2, this angel seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. And our amillennialist friends, they'll say things like, well, this is the most symbolic book in the Bible. It's the hardest thing to interpret. And I just want to say, well, It's pretty clear what these symbols are communicating, isn't it? I mean, what Satan has been doing in chapter 13, he's no longer able to do in chapter 20. These these symbols are not that hard to interpret. His deceptive activity is cut off until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Verse 4, then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, for the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God. It's almost as though John wants to say, remember those guys I talked about in chapter 12, 11, who loved not their lives even unto death, and who conquered Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony? And then he continues, and those who had not worshiped the beast. And it's like he's saying, remember those people I talked about in 13, 8, that, that were, their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they, they wouldn't worship the beast or its image and had not received its mark, 13, 14 through 18, on their foreheads or their hands? They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And, and I think we want to note, this can't mean their regeneration. Because these are people there in verse 4 who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. The only people that get beheaded for the testimony of Jesus are people who are regenerated. I don't think it can mean they came to life in the presence of God in heaven in the intermediate state. Because, like like we saw in chapter 15, they're already there. And then the text goes on, verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So you've got a resurrection... And then the thousand-year period, and then the rest of the dead coming to life, being raised from the dead. A resurrection on either side of the thousand years. And then at the end of verse 5 there, this is the first resurrection, the one that happens prior to the thousand years. And I think this is John's way of saying, 
let me explain to you why it is that Psalm 1-5 says that the wicked will not rise in the judgment because I'm talking about the first resurrection. Let me explain to you why Isaiah 26 says they will not arise because that's talking about this first resurrection. And, and I think John might also say, and here we're moving into New Testament corroboration of this, I think John might say, remember the way that Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15? If you'd like to maybe keep a finger here in Revelation 20 and look at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul writes, starting in verse 21, as by a man came death, Adam, by a man, Jesus, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, and, and I would note here, I don't have time to take you to all these passages, but there are a number of places in the New Testament that speak of Christ being raised from the dead. And if we were to translate that a little bit more literally to bring out the, the sense of it, we might translate it something like raised from among the dead ones, meaning there are these dead people and Jesus is bodily raised so that he's separated from those dead people by reentering re-entering life. You get the same language of people being raised from among the dead ones. So all of that language, I think, substantiates this idea that you're going to have a first resurrection and then the resurrection of everyone else. Look at, look at what Paul says here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Jesus is raised from among the dead ones. Then he comes and those who belong to him are raised from among the dead ones. And then verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to the Father, to God the Father. I think this is talking about at the end of the millennium. After destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And I think that's Paul's way of saying, then the rest of the dead will be raised. Similar kinds of things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 I'm going to read verse 16. It says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And this implies that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then at some later period, I think John is basically saying after the thousand years, the rest of the dead will be raised. So all this to say, what John is presenting in Revelation 20 is intended to motivate his audience to be faithful unto death. In the book of Revelation, you know, there, there, there is, there's this moment when God seals his servants. And then as the various judgments begin to fall, the sealing of God's servants protects them from God's judgments that fall on the wicked. Satan, by contrast, it's almost like he's trying to fake what God did by having his servants take his name and the number of his name on their forehead or their hands. And yet that won't protect them from God's judgment, will it? And whereas if, if Satan kills God's people, God's going to raise them from the dead, well, Satan's people face God's judgment after that second resurrection. So this hope for the resurrection and the millennial reign of Christ, I think, is intended by John to fill out our biblical theological understanding of resurrection and to ground our courage and our pers perseverance through various forms of persecution. And I, and I think that this idea of seed falling into the ground and dying. I would remind you what the Lord Jesus said there in, in John 12. The Lord Jesus, they, they brought the Greeks to him, and in John 12, 23, Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's talking about going to the cross. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's talking about his cross and resurrection as though he's a seed that's going to fall into the ground, a grain of wheat that's going to fall into the ground and die that it might bear fruit. And then his next words, verse 25, applies this to his followers. 
He doesn't say here what he says in the synoptic gospels. What he says there is, if anyone would come after me, he must take up the cross and follow me. Here he says, John 12, 25, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I think what Jesus is saying is something like this. If it matters more to you to save your skin, and so you're a coward, you will lose your life. If it matters more to you to keep your job than to be faithful to the Lord Jesus, then you will lose your life. If it matters more to you to have the approval of the world and so you make the, their good confession according to their doctrinal statement, and you, you call gay marriage marriage, and you accept the transgender pronouns, and you go along with all that stuff, you will lose your life. But if you say, it is more important to me to be faithful to God than to have the approval of the world, than to keep my job, than to not be fined, than to not be sent to prison, or whatever the case may be, to not be slain with the sword. It is more important to me, if you hate your life in this world, you will keep it for eternal life. Jesus then goes on to say, verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. It's, it's that take up the cross kind of thing. And where I am, there will my servant be also. I mean, he doesn't fill everything out here, but it's implied, isn't it? Because he's, he's going to say just a chapter or so from now, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back to take you to be with me where I am. So I think that even in these statements, the resurrection and the reward in heaven is informing what the Lord Jesus is saying. There's a great moment. Now we're back to courage. There's a great moment in the Two Towers movie when uh, they're, they're barricaded in Helm's Deep and King Theoden says to Aragorn, ride out with me for death and glory. That's our opportunity. Ride out with me for death and glory. That what they're doing is they're going to ride out against oh, an overwhelming force thinking we are sure to die. And the glory part is assuming the good guys are going to win and the good guys are going to appreciate what we've done after we've died. That's, that's the assumption. And at some future time, we are going to be rewarded for this faithfulness. That's informing the way those people are acting. And I'm not, I don't think Winston Churchill was necessarily a Christian, but the same thing is informing his response. When, when he said, as, as Great Britain was facing the Nazi invasion, and he said to his people, if this long island history of ours is to come to an end at last, let it only end when each of us lies choking in a pool of his own blood. In other words, we're going to fight to the end. And the reason we're going to fight to the end is because these things are true and right and good. And on the other side of our death, somehow things are going to be put right and the fact that we stood for the right is going to be appreciated, and we will, I think in some sense, Churchill thought, be rewarded for our stand for the right. And that brings me to this quote by G.K. Chesterton from his book, Orthodoxy. He writes of courage. He says, courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. And then he quotes John 12, he that will lose his life, the same shall save it. And he says, this is not a piece of mysticism for saints and heroes. It is a piece of everyday advice for sailors or mountaineers. It might be printed in an alpine guide or a drill book. This paradox is the whole principle of courage, even of quite earthly or quite brutal courage. A man cut off by the sea may save his life if he will risk it on the precipice. He can only get away from death by continually stepping within an inch of it. A soldier surrounded by enemies, if he is to cut his way out, needs to combine a strong desire for living with a strange carelessness about dying. He must not merely cling to life, for then he will be a coward and will not escape. He must not merely wait for death, for then he will be a suicide and will not escape. He must seek his life in a spirit of furious 
indifference to it. The first moment of cowardice, I think, is when Satan, when Satan was tempting Eve and Adam stood there and did nothing. He said nothing. What he should have said, I think, was, uh, Mr. Serpent Man, you will either stop talking to this woman right now and leave this garden, or you and I will fight to the death. But you are not going to continue. That was the first act of cowardice. And the great moment of courage is when in that, in that garden on the Mount of Olives, you can clearly see the gates of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley. And it's evident that a cohort of soldiers with swords and torches, you can hear them coming, you can see them coming, and they're making their way to the garden with Judas at their head. And the man stepped forward and said, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And I think he revealed his, his transcendent divine glory and he knocked them down. And then he lets them up and he says, I asked you, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And his response this time was, if you seek me, take me and let these go free. Let's pray together. Father, we read that for the joy set before him, the Lord Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. And Lord, the scriptures, I think, fill out the picture that the Lord Jesus knew he would have the glory and the joy of being raised from the dead to reign, to cleanse the world of the way that Adam had defiled it as he reigned for a thousand years, and then to bring in the new heavens and new earth. And Lord, we pray that you would so inspire us with faith in the Lord Jesus, so instruct our minds, help us to understand that the life of a coward who betrays you, betrays those dearest to him, betrays those under his protection, that life is not worth living. And Lord, Cause us to be convinced to the depth of our bones that you will keep your promises, that the seed that falls into the ground and dies will bear fruit. Lord, make us believe that you will raise the dead and use that, we pray, to make us hear John's call that this is for the perseverance of the saints. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. And make us faithful, Lord, we pray. Because of Jesus, by the power of your spirit, as we trust your word, amen.